Fantastic. Um, so hi to everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, uh, as Angela said, uh, I'm very bicultural because I'm Italian. I live in London. I've been there 15 years now, 16 actually. And um, I am a civil engineer as my first degree. And then uh, I studied um, landscape architecture, although I have always been a gardener in my heart since I was a child. So I'm kind of proud to be a gardener before being a design designer. So that's why uh, the title of my, um, let's say, lecture, it's, it's a really big name, but you know, my little talk is Plant Driven Design. Uh, because I, I, I'm not pretending to telling you anything new about garden design or architecture. Just what I want to share is the fun I always have with plants. Uh, also because plants basically are the, the bricks of the landscape architecture because you can be the best architect ever, but if you don't know, you, if you don't know your plants, you know, <laughs> The garden, in, the garden is not going to be uh, what you are expecting. So uh, I'm going to talk to you, to talk to you about a um, section of my garden in Gorizia near Trieste. Trieste is, uh, you know, Italy. Uh, Trieste is in the northeast on the Adriatic Sea. Um, it's the last Italian town uh, before the border with uh, Slovenia or with ex-Yugoslavia, if <laughs> you want to call it. And so the climate is very strange because um, it's kind of Mediterranean in a way, uh, but um, on the other hand is the door from which the Burian, the cold wind from Russia, comes into the Mediterranean when it comes from the east. When it comes from the west, it comes from the, you know, the, the Rhone Valley, the, it's, the, it's, the, um, it's the Mistral. Mm -hmm. So either you have Burian or Mistral. So, uh, uh, and then it's a melt pot in terms of uh, floras because you have the Balkan flora, the Mediterranean flora, the Alpine flora, all uh, meeting uh, in this kind of area. So the variety of plants I can grow is actually relatively wide, uh, although, yeah, the climate condition and the uh, soil condition are not particularly favorable, uh, as I said, because of extremes in the temperatures and because the soil is actually very thin and very rocky. Um, what I'd like to tell you before starting, it's that basically, Often I hear people, uh, you know, uh, talking about the beauties of a garden, uh, praising nature for its well-doing. But actually, you know, there is nothing more wrong than saying that nature has done the garden. Because uh, if we leave nature at work in a garden, we might as well not even make a garden because nature will destroy it. So the garden is something completely man-made. So that has to be, I would say, clear before I start. So the garden is, per definition, controlled nature. So it's a place, man-made, where nature is free to do its, its things up to a certain point until basically the creator, so a, a human person, the gardener, decides that nature has to change its way. So it's a continuous struggle, a challenge between the gardener and nature. And basically gardening with nature is a sort of opening of a Pandora box, you know? And what are the demons that come out of this box? They are clearly the cold winters, the hot summers, uh, the weeds, uh, the pests and diseases. Um, uh, and often people say, um, oh, I have a bad climate. Oh, I have a bad soil. No, that's wrong. It's not bad climate or bad soil. It's the wrong choice of plants. That's why the garden is not successful. And um, that's why I'm focusing my talk on plants. 
And very interesting, if you read those two comments by those two famous gardeners, Christopher Lloyd and Beth Chatto, it's two different approaches towards gardening. Clearly, I don't know whether you all know about Gray Dixter, so Christopher Lloyd's garden and uh, the three gardens of the Chateau, the gravel garden, the damp garden and the woodland garden. So they are beautiful, but they both uh, are created from very different uh, uh, ideas. Although, um, and, and by the way, Christopher Lloyd and Beth Chateau, they were friends. They admired each other, they respected each other but they had this completely different approach. But what unites them in their doing and in their success in, is that they knew their plants. So that's, the, that's the, the core of their garden. They loved gardening with plants. So trying, you know, it, gardening is trial and error in a way. And um, uh, clearly as a designer, I approach my clients in a completely different way if you want in a more commercial or more corporate way where you kind of tend to use your senior knoll plants or your a secure plant planting palette, which is quite, let's say safe. Uh, but in my own garden, I like to experiment, to have fun because I would be bored, you know, in one of those uh, garden makes only of hedges, <laughs> you know, and clip topiary that look the same all year round. And uh, although I designed them, so, uh, but in a way it's not for me, <laughs> not for my own fun. And uh, now the, uh, the, the, the piece of my garden, I'm going to show you or talk to you about today, it's uh, let's say an extension of my garden. And it's a small plot because it's a rectangle, 40 meters by 25. So it's thousand square meters. Uh, and unfortunately on two sides is surrounded by really ugly buildings. So mm -hmm. um, it's not a garden with a view. It's very easy to make a garden when you have a beautiful view. <laughs> you, know, you just decorate the view and the garden is beautiful. And if you are so lucky, uh, that's not the case for me. And um, this, this basically long rectangle uh, connects, as you can see on the right hand side with, uh, let's call it the old garden. Maybe another time I will talk to you about that one. And then uh, on the left hand side, you see it's the nursery where I have rows of plants I like to grow and uh, they are peonies. So my favorite flower. Uh, what I've decided to do, uh, this is the only hint of design I'm going to um, suggest. So because the plot is very long and narrow, and basically I'm wasting half of it, creating two boundaries of evergreen. So on the northeastern side and the southwestern side. So I decided to create two different types of, um, in Italian we would say ambientazioni or like um, moods in the garden. So on the more shady northern side, I have created what I called the Balkan scrubland. So taking inspiration from the woodland around me, uh, but also from the woodland, you know, in the Balkans and extending it, you know, the mountains of Greece, the mountains of Turkey, up to the, down to the Caucasus, basically. And on the other side, divided by the hedge in the middle, uh, the more sunny side, I created a more, Mediterranean garden, uh, following a bit, you know, the steps of the gravel garden of Beth Chato. So choosing plants which are more, um, let's say Mediterranean. Um, so the two gardens, um, when, you are, when you are in one of the two gardens, you don't see the others. So you have those long views, which make uh, the garden look much bigger, much longer. Uh, without connecting the two gardens. So you come in from the Balkan scrubland, from the old garden, you arrive towards the nursery, and then you come back on the Mediterranean garden, and you have a long walk, uh, which, seems, which seems much longer than what actually it is. But that's the illusion of, of creating like, like um, uh, Angela Yutami Quinte, how would you say, uh, like a Le, le quinte di un teatro, like the, 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 
Ha. Non mi arriva. The wings. The wings. The w- yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah, on a theater where you have different. Yeah. And. Um, Okay, so I would start now with the, uh, let's call it the, the, the Balkan scrubland, so the more woodlandy bit. Uh, and I have a, a, a um, um, you will see it through the seasons. Uh, the first observation, there is no lawn, because being a collector, you know, why to waste space for a lawn when you can have nice plants instead? So that's the, that's the, I have a big lawn in the old garden. Uh, so I kind of, I'm happy with that one. And in this part of the garden, I preferred a more uh, secluded or congested, if you want to call it atmosphere, um, where to uh, set a collection of plants uh, in a kind of naturalistic way. You know, when you have uh, in plants which are kind of showy, it's like having lots of prima donnas in the same room. So it's it's on a the design point of view. Is <laughs> so as as in real life, it's always a clash or or, or a fight. So um, you need something like a background, a soft background to. Um, uh, to adapt all those prima donnas. And that's why I've decided this to give, you know, to give them a very almost messy, untidy background to soften them. Uh, as you see, um, uh, I haven't used many trees. You know, there are a few cypresses just to give some vertical accent. Uh, someone would say, uh, jokingly, it's 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 typical of the um, uh, male gardens, you know, the cypresses, the the erections, and you know we are all obsessed about it. <laughs> and uh, the other the other the other um, trees I've used is the uh, downy oak, which you can see here, multi-stemmed, which have grown from seed. It's Quercus pubescens in uh, in Latin which is uh, the oak that grows basically everywhere in the mountains of central Italy, and then down to Greece until the, um, the Balkans, down to Greece and Turkey. So trees literally, which don't need much uh, care to grow. Um, you see, uh, so the first picture was March and here we are in April. Um, Underneath the oaks, I have tried to um, uh, naturalize uh, this beautiful, um, you see this, um, this kind of yellowish uh, or lemon green. It's a mixture between Euphorbia uh, vulfenii, which is wild where I live on the rocks, on the cliffs in Trieste. And the other one is uh, the Smenium. Uh, it comes from Greece and Turkey. It's a very funny story where the seeds come from. I collected them when I was working at Kew, uh, at Kew Gardens in 2005. I did a double internship there, six months. And basically at that time, the task was to remove it from the garden where it <laughs> became a weed uh, because it actually uh, sells seeds very, very easily. And, I have taken this, this kind of weed behavior as a uh, advantage, and now I have it everywhere in the garden. It's a monocarpic plant, which means when it flowers, it dies. Uh, so in a way, it's a gentle weed. Where, we, where, where I want it, I, I, I let it do what it does, and where it disturbs, I just remove it before it flowers, or I cut the heads before it goes to seed. So. Um, uh, uh, here are more images of, of the same uh, kind of view, but as you can see here and there, there are the prima donnas, as you can see in the background, some of the peonies or on the cypress on the far left, you see it's a rosa, it's rosa fortuniana, it's a hybrid between um, Levigata and Banksia, yeah? and uh, more images here. You see, for example, on the far right, it's another rose. Uh, this is uh, the Lijang rose. It's a wild-ish 
uh, rose, which was introduced uh, to Italy in the 1980s by Gianluppo Osti. And uh, a cutting of this plant was given to me by the old Osti in 2009. So it's, it's a memento. And uh, because by the way, I also like plants to have a story. It's much nicer, and, you know, they remind you of, of, of a person or of, of a moment or it's a nice connection. And clearly in the middle of this picture, you can see it's a peony. So it's my passion. Uh, this one it's, uh, is a dark form of Peonia arietina, uh, which comes from Turkey. And it's the mountains of Turkey, clearly. And uh, it's perfectly happy in uh, my climate. Um, another one, uh, clearly, um, that grows very well is um, the wild uh, Peonia rockii. That one is from China, so you can see, you know, the, the melt pot of, 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 of plants, you know, the provenance is very various. And this one is actually a wild plant, you see, which mm. I grew from seeds um, that was sent to me by a, a guy who works in the Forestry Commission in, in China. Uh, and this is through uh, Peonia rockii. Uh, for the experts, as you can see, um, all the, um, excluding the black blotches at the base of each petal, um, anything else in the flower is white. So that's the proof that it is the through species. When basically all hybrids, which might have white petals, uh, they might have uh, different colors inside the blotch, but we will, we will see better pictures. Um, so more peonies I grow in this um, woodland are for, for example, Peonia mascula. This one comes from uh, Puglia, uh, Southern Italy. Uh, Puglia is the, um, is the heel of the boot, <laughs> you know, if you consider Italy like a boot. Um, here is together with uh, this uh, little cyclamen, the spring cyclamen, cyclamen um, uh, repandum, which actually comes from uh, the islands of uh, Dalmatian, the Dalmatian islands, so Croatia now. Um, this is another peony, the flowers slightly later, you see with the, with the bluebells, and this is peonia flavescens. And it is the Italian um, version or Sicilian because it grows in Sicily in the woods north of Palermo. Um, it's the Italian version of the Peonia mascula Hellenica. So it's the like the Greek white mm, male peony. This is the Sicilian variation. So considering Sicily part of the, the same uh, group. And, and here we are on the other side again of the Mediterranean is Peonia Caucasica from the name. It comes from Caucasus. Now actually the correct name should be Peonia Daurica subspecies Corifolia. I mean, Peonia <laughs> Caucasica is much nicer. So uh, uh, also happy in my uh, climate. And then clearly it's uh, the unpronounceable uh, Peonium locosevicii, uh, or as the English call it, Molly the Witch, uh, just to make the, this Xolilingua uh, uh, easier, and which is the only herbaceous peony bearing this yellow color. And it is amazing. Um, there is a... <laughs> The problem of those peonies is that they are all very ephemeral in the meaning that the flower, the top lasts maybe four or five days if you're yeah. lucky and it doesn't rain. But, you know, it's the, the expectancy of, of, you know, seeing those buds growing, you know, they always were um, a fascination for me. So I, that's why it probably is my favorite flower. Oh, this is another one, Peonia vitmaniana. Uh, also from Caucaso, uh, with huge leaves and this kind of ivory uh, color, uh, it's definitely one of my one of my favorites. 
And then again, on the other side of, 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 of Europe, this is Pionian Modiae. And that one comes from um, the foothills of the Himalaya in Pakistan. Uh, it's another very easy plant to grow. And um, uh, the, the great advantage of this species is that, as you can see, it bears more flowers on the same stem. So if you are unlucky with one of the flowers, you might get more lucky with the second. So the flowering lasts a bit longer, probably a week to 10 days. And it's actually quite a big plant. Matteo, can I just ask you to just yeah. introduce us to what the sort of, what are you doing to the soil? Uh, you know, how do you keep them happy here? I mean, you say- uh, that How they keep them happy? They are happy in my soil. So my soil is uh, red clay with lots of stones. Uh, and what I do when I plant them, I add, uh, I don't replace the soil, I just add lots of uh, compost, leaf mold or leaf compost, uh, and I mix it. And um, my friends, they, they, they laugh because they say um, in Italian, che you faccio una messa cantata. You know, for who is not Catholic, probably doesn't make means anything, but you know, it's like, uh, doing a, 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 a chorus in the mass, you know, those like 18th century masses that last forever. So that's my, my uh, soil preparation. Uh, as, the, as the Brits say, um, one pound for the whole, one penny for the plant. So I, 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 I spend lots of time and effort in preparing the soil, making literally like a souffle, very, very soft and, and, and aerated and well mixed. And then I plant a peony, which usually, because they're actually quite expensive to buy, is not bigger than a little uh, small finger on your hand. And it takes clearly two, three, even four years sometimes when you grow them from seed to have a decent plant in flowering size. Uh, but, you know, if there are more questions about the, the various species, which are slightly different, I can answer at the end. I'm happy to answer at the end. Uh, and here, it's basically the last one of the wild herbaceous peony to flower is Peonia peregrina. And as you see in this sea of uh, bluebells, uh, is the Spanish bluebell uh, with the Helleborus agutifolius, is the one from Corsica and Sardinia, and the Smyrnium perfoliatum from Greece. Uh, so the, the hedge is bay and, uh, you know, it's, it's like a... a, a, a a mix of uh, Mediterranean uh, species. Uh, yeah, here and now um, when the um, herbaceous peony finish, the tree peony start. And as you can see, um, the, the, they are mixed between the bluebells and this kind of wildish grass, which actually is a Brisa maxima. Uh, which is that little um, annual uh, grass is actually a weed, uh, but it's very nice because it's um, it's not particularly um, uh, invasive, although it sells seeds everywhere without making too much damage to the plants around. It was actually the seeds were given to me by my uh, dear colleague and friend Maurizio, Maurizio Zai. He will talk next month, so we'll, you will hear about his, 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 his Herculean struggles in his gardens in Sardinia. But you know, and that's for example, every time I, 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 I swear against this weed, I always think, oh Maurizio, why did you give it to me? So that's, it's a nice momentum. And uh, so, the three peonies I like the most are the hybrids of uh, Peonia rockii. Uh, and they all bear basically this black blotch or dark blotch at the base of the uh, petals. Um, they are very complex hybrids, um, but the beauty of them is that they are extremely vigorous and uh, um, the plants are usually very upright and uh, they hold the flowers quite well, also if it rains. Um, uh, 
I much prefer pianists which are single or semi-double. So um, with one row of petals, or like in this case, uh, the picture you are seeing, uh, with two or three rows of petals, but not completely full in the middle. Um, the Chinese, they have a very dry spring. They much prefer the really filled um, peonies. But where it rains, you know, they kind of flop more. When the Japanese, they do prefer the, uh, the single uh, flowers because clearly Japan has a much more rainy spring. So uh, this one in particular is one of my hybrids. This plant is approximately well, 20 years old. Uh, I grew it from seed and it's a seedling between Peonia ostii and Peonia rocky. So it's, it bears the vigor of Peonia ostii, which is very, very vigorous and uh, this, the color and the blotch of um, the rocky peony. It's, uh, it's a joy, it's one of the best plants in my garden. And this one in particular, I don't know whether there is anyone uh, uh, who is really into peonies. It's like the, uh, the, 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 the grail of peonies. This is the peony from the garden of High Down High Down was the garden of uh, Friedrich Stern. He was a, uh, a plantsman in the first half of the 20th century. I think he died in the late 60s. And uh, this is the first, basically, uh, uh, let's call it rocky peony gr that was grown in Europe. And uh, it bears like an ancestry from the seeds that were sent to the Arnold Arboretum by Joseph Rock himself uh, in the 1920s. Although this is uh, not Peonia rockii, this is a hybrid of the rocky peony. Uh, and as you can see mm. in this detail of the flowers, you see the filaments that bear the, uh, the pollen they have those uh, red, uh, they are red, very dark. And this is a, a, a sign of hybridization, hybridization. So um, although it is historically the first peony, the first peony with blotches to be, to, our, to have arrived in Europe, it's, 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 it's not really Peonia rockii. So it's, it's a hybrid. Uh, now, basically from April, we say goodbye to the peonies, we get into May, where something else replaces the peonies. Um, and what I have chosen with the Aquilegias, that kind of bridge over from the peonies is to the irises. And the iris here, it's iris, uh, iris pallida or iris dalmatica, which is the one that grows wild on the cliffs here. Um, the uh, red uh, flowers, the red, um, it's uh, Knotia, Knotia Macedonica, uh, and the white Umbrellifera, it's, um, uh, it's um, uh, Orlaia Grandiflora, uh, the, the French cow parsley, how the Brits call it. And it's actually, it's not French at all. It grows in, 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 uh, in, in the hills here um, near Trieste. Uh, here you have a, a closer shot. Um, when the garden wasn't as shady as it is now, this picture is probably four years old, five years old. And you can see uh, the variety of annuals in the mix was much higher. And now it has kind of settled. Uh, you see those kind of uh, pink flowers, the tall ones. Uh, this is um, Agrostema gitago. It's a weed uh, of the cornfields. Um, the problem of it is that the seeds are extremely poisonous. So <laughs> when harvesting the wheat, clearly the seeds <coughs> ended in the wheat. So mm -hmm. It has been with, with weed killers, it has been eradicated from, from the fields, but it's beautiful. It's a beautiful uh, plant. I suggest you grow it. And then in the background, you start already to see 
the uh, the flowers of late May June, you know, the ones that say, "Hey, summer is arriving." You know, it's the and and we are in another side of of the world. You see the Escoltia, Escoltia Californica, the orange one at the base, uh, together with the uh, Nigella Damascena from the Middle Eastern. Okay, you have more picture of May. Clearly, it's easy to have a garden, a nice garden in May. I always say that, but you know, that's the joy of May. Uh, it's even more a uh, picture of the garden. As you can see, uh, I have said no lawn. So it's, it's, it's all flowers and, and, and small paths through. Okay, now it's summer, it's June. Uh, all the colors have settled and only a few prima donna are singing the arias now. So you have the Vabina Bonariensis uh, on, the, on the right, and then on the left is the fantastic, it's another Californian one, is the Romnea Colteri. Uh, as the American call it, it's the fried poppy, uh, sorry, the fried egg. It's basically from the poppy family, and the flower literally looks, even in size, like a fried egg with huge white petals and uh, an orange blotch uh, on top. Uh, and here clearly from June, we get into July and we are in the Mediterranean. So we are happy that the garden is still green, but clearly the flowers uh, have gone. Um, uh, I'm not really into the uh, brown is beautiful philosophy. I much prefer to see my greenery <laughs> uh, where is possible, clearly, where water is available uh, and sustainable. I kind of prefer to use it. So uh, I have a well. So in a way, the water I use goes back into the soil so I don't feel guilty in using it. I don't water too much, but I do water a little bit. Um, and here again, you know, the garden is kind of fading uh, towards the summer. But um, what's important is um, to create kind of with the shrubs and with the texture of the plants, which don't bear flowers anymore, a kind of uh, structure. So the more structural the garden is, and that's, a, I would say, the golden rule of gardening, the more structural the garden is, the less you miss the flowers when they are gone, because clearly the flowers come and go. And in a climate like the Mediterranean one, uh, you have a long pause in the flowering season, you know, by the end of June until probably mid-September, you have good two months at least of, of, of nothing. Uh, so you, you do need a strong, structure in the garden to uh, sustain this period. And then clearly, uh, when is the garden coming back to life? After the first rain in September, in October. So you have the, uh, all the saffron crocuses, which you can see in the background. This picture is actually October. Um, and together with the saffron crocuses, what is this? Is this, is this gladioli? Uh, from South Africa. It's a hybrid of the so-called Christmas uh, gladiolus, gladiolus dalenii. We don't really know what the origin of this one is. Uh, is it grown in my region? And they call it uh, il gladio dei morti. So, so it's like the, the, the gladiolus of the death because it flowers at Halloween. So the 1st of November. Um, and it is beautiful. You know, it would be very difficult to combine this kind of red in another season. It would be nearly impossible. But you know, with the low light of autumn and the orange colors on the amelanchias, on the leaves, on the lilies, on the grasses, is actually beautiful because it brings lots of uh, light in the garden. Okay, now we go to the other side of the garden, you know, the so-called Mediterranean uh, garden, uh, where basically there are no trees at all. Uh, the soil is very, very rocky. Uh, sorry, very, there are lots of stones. And um, uh, so 
I really have decided to uh, choose plants from uh, the Mediterranean environment. This picture is, I would say, is the end of March, beginning of April. And uh, what you can see everywhere, it's the, I do like repetition, it's the, uh, I call it the Van Gogh iris, you know, it's iris germanica, you know, the famous picture by Van Gogh, that's the one. And the uh, pink uh, masses uh, along the uh, footpath is actually a thyme, which I collected from the edge of the road. You know, that little edge of the road, which where, where uh, nothing grows. Okay, this thyme was actually growing on top of the tarmac. So I said, if it grows it flowers there, it must be an exceptional garden plant. So I decided to introduce it in my garden and it's fantastic. Even in the Mediterranean garden, I have uh, planted some peonies. This is probably my best treasure. It's Peonia clusiae, and it comes from Crete, from the mountains of Crete. Uh, the scent, of this one is fantastic, it's amazing. Uh, it is not the easiest to grow, I must admit, uh, but uh, you know, on the far left, you can see the footpath. You see that gravel is not added. That's how my soil is. So, uh, and if you look at picture of this peony growing on the mountains of Crete, uh, is exactly where they grow in the stones. That's why probably they are so happy with me. Uh, then, you know, this is evolving uh, towards the mid-April. Uh, the Iris Germanica is replaced by this white iris, which is Iris Florentina, um, which historically were used in the region of Florence, in Tuscany, to make um, a scent uh, from drying and uh, pulverizing the roots. And then again, we shoot on the other side of the globe with the blue uh, Cyanotus from California again, which, you know, um, contrast quite nicely with the white and the, and the yellow. Unfortunately, uh, Cyanotus is not long, is not long lived. You know, uh, those blue two plants, this picture is probably 2016. 2017, uh, they died. One, the year this picture was taken, and one, the year after. You know, mm -hmm. they are like uh, shooting stars. They, they, they grow, they become beautiful, and all of a sudden, they decide to, to commit suicide. So that's, you know, <laughs> they, and leave a big hole in the garden, you know, giving you thousand questions. What am I going to feel that a big hole? <laughs> so... Uh, okay, here again, we are moving towards uh, late spring. This is already May. And again, with the uh, short lavender, which is uh, Lavandula um, angustifolia, you have again the Vabena bonariensis, the Lychnis coronaria, uh, some of the Eremurus uh, from the steppes of Middle Asia, uh, in the background, you see some eryngiums, uh, the verbascums, um, and again, the Orlia grandiflora, you see these white umbrellifera that kind of makes a matrix uh, in this composition. I just like to point you, you know, look at the top right angle of the picture, you see the ugly buildings I am surrounded with, you know, white with uh, green uh, shutters. So it's not really the the, the Il Golfo di Napoli with uh, Vesuvio on the background. So <laughs> that's the, so my garden is basically, it's, um, it's, it's uh, designed to look at himself. So the views in the garden uh, are uh, towards the garden itself. And by the way, you see that hedge right at the end of the picture, uh, it has been uh, removed. Uh, and now I have a more uh, direct connection between the old garden and this garden. Um, and it makes it even bigger. It looks even bigger with this long view. Uh, here again, it is uh, the height of May. 
uh, with Flomis, uh, then you see some, um, what's Centrantus, the white Centrantus. Uh, uh, yes, uh, and the white alliums, it's another um, allium which is wild in my area, it's called allium nigrum or nigrum, don't ask me why. It's nigrum, but I think the seeds or the inside of the flower, although the flower is completely white. And then again, this is June. It's the same shot, the same frame. Sorry, apologies. You see, it's the same um, view, nearly. And now the flowers have been replaced by what? It's the last of the Scholzia, and uh, it's the Gaura. Uh, and the um, salvia sclarea, which you can see on the in the left hand corner. Um, and the advantage of this kind of very untidy look is that you don't see the weeds in it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually made of nice weeds. And the bad weeds, they are in between, but you don't notice them. <laughs> because, you know, I live half of my life in London and the other half in Italy. So it would be impossible for me to, you know, bear a maintenance at the level of, you know, Great Dixer or of a mixed border. It would be impossible. So in a way, I decided to, to go for this solution which uh, makes me happy because I can grow lots of plants. It's very variable because the garden changes in the season. But at the same time, I've chosen plants that adapt quite okay with my conditions of soil and climate. So my job as a gardener uh, or as a lazy gardener or as a gardener that is never there, it's a bit easier. It makes my life a bit easier. Um, Again, this is August. Uh, clearly, uh, the amount of brown goes up <laughs> the more you go towards the summer. Uh, but still, if what gets brown are actually the uh, annuals, uh, you see what's brown is actually the, the, that beautiful umbrellifera, it's the olaya, it gets brown. But what stays green, and that's the secret in my uh, opinion, are the shrubs, the structure, you know, uh, whether they are pines, or whether it's a cork oak or a myrtle or a, a strawberry tree or a cypress, you know, you do need those plants to bear a bit of green where the green is possible because clearly I am in the north of Italy. So it's my, my, my situation is not comparable to, to, to Mauritius. Or, or you will see next month, or to some situation in the south of France, as we saw in, you know, two lectures ago. Uh, but still, you know, having lots of structure helps with the brownery of the landscape, makes it uh, less brown and more bearable. Uh, and here again, you see, for example, from South Africa, it's the, 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 ah, uh, 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 Nifofia, Nifofia uvaria nobilis. It's the, it's the big, um, the big form, and then on the left, you can see some of the uh, agapanthus flowering in in sky blue between uh, the goras. Um, and then again, that's still, that's, I would say is again, is the end of July. Uh, you see the sea pods in, uh, of the, um, um, uh, oh. uh, help me, it's the Damasina. The, Nigella? Nigella Damasina, apologies, yeah. <laughs> Uh, the Nigella Damasina, and you also see the heads of the alliums, uh, you know, in front of the Artemisia. Uh, so some brown is beautiful, but not all brown is beautiful. <laughs> that's, my, that's my idea. 
uh, and then clearly this is again, this is evolving towards uh, July, August. And, and, and now this is a jump uh, towards the winter. This is the first frost in mid-November. Um, you see um, the grasses, you know, the perennials and the annuals are now completely gone. Uh, the grasses still stand. Uh, what we have here, we have the uh, Stipa gigantea, the Stipa brachytrica, and the Calamagrostis Carl Foster, you know, the one that grows very vertical. Uh, but what really holds the, the scenery are the, is the structure, the evergreens. You know, without that, uh, you know, uh, in Italian we would say it would be a un paglierone. Come diresti, Angela, in inglese? <laughs> Come si dice? Cosa? Un paglierone, you know, like, like, a, like, a, you know, it's, 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 you know, without the structure, it would be literally only brown. Uh, when actually you see the frost uh, covers those evergreens is is um, makes the looks more interesting. Um, so this was my experiment uh, in um, in this little rectangle of garden, uh, and now I want to talk to you. We have. What, what's the time? Let me check. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. We have another 10 minutes. Uh, I will talk um, about the peonies, which is the flowers per in eccellenza for me. It's the most beautiful. And I'd like to start with uh, the herbaceous peonies, in particular with the so-called herbaceous hybrids. Um, most of the herbaceous peonies we are used to are the so-called uh, lactiflora hybrids. And they flower much later. They flower, uh, this picture is actually April, and the lactiflora start usually in May. They, I would say they flower nearly with the roses. The herbaceous hybrids, what are they? Are basically hybrids between the lactiflora, which comes from China, and it is very easy to grow, and those Mediterranean species you have seen earlier, which are actually relatively difficult to grow. So those hybrids are easy to grow as the Japanese one, but bear the softness of the wild species. Uh, and the big advantage is that having big, lousy, simple flowers, so with only one row of petal, they don't need staking. So when it's windy or when it's rainy, the flower tolerates this condition much better than the really filled uh, lactiflora hybrids. Um, those hybrids were, uh, the father of those hybrids is uh, Saunders. He was an American and he started hybridizing them in from the 1930s until his death in the 1970s and then his daughter carried on so they are called herbaceous hybrids or saunders hybrids and they are beautiful uh, they are a bit more expensive than the lactiflora hybrids let's say a division with three eyes uh, is going to cost around probably 20 25 30 euros rather than 10 or 12 that, you know, a lactiflora would cost. But still, they are slower. They are definitely slower because their inheritance from the uh, wild species is, you know, that they are at least slow. So I really strongly suggest you to, you know, open like an internet page or a catalog and look for the herbaceous hybrids of peonies. They are beautiful. Um, Okay, this is a friend. Uh, now I'm talking about um, the tree peonies. And the tree peonies are often called, uh, you know, Peonia sufruticosa. Peonia sufruticosa doesn't exist in nature. It's like a, 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 a um, uh, imperial invention of the Brits. You know, we love the Brits. Uh, you know, when the first peony came to Europe in 1798, 
because no one had seen it in Europe and the British discovered it, although the Chinese had it for a thousand years already, but you know, that was discovered by the Brits. We love the Brits. They gave it the name of a species. So it was called Peonia sufruticosa. But actually it is a very complex hybrid because the Chinese were playing with, uh, you know, wild peonies for centuries before this. And um, after China opened its borders, you know, after 1989, and more studies were made on the wild species in China, which were literally uh, not known at all um, until that date, um, it's now clear that Peonia sufruticosa is a very complex hybrid between five or six wild species, Chinese wild species, uh, that still exist in the mountains of China, um, and that in different percentage, you know, have composed the blood of what we now call Peonia sufruticosa, of the many thousands of Peonia sufruticosa. So one of them, the one that gives the vigor and the height to the peonies, it's actually Peonia ostii, and um, is dedicated to Gianluca Osti, who kind of discovered it again in the 1990s in China. And can you imagine what discovery was it? Because you know it was grown in the fields, so to collect the roots. So it wasn't really a huge discovery, but you know. And the Chinese call it uh, Feng Dan Bai, which means the white phoenix, La Fenice Bianca. Uh, and you can see why. This plant is probably 18, 20 years old, but as you can see, it's taller than my friend, and it bears, you know, hundreds of uh, flowers. It's, it's a joy. As, as I said, this peony gives the vigor. When you see a hybrid, if the hybrid is very vigorous, usually there is some peonia ostia in it. And um, uh, the other one that gives the vigor is actually the peonia rochiae. We saw it earlier on. And beside the vigor, it all, also gives the, uh, the blotches, you know, this, um, uh, this, 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 um, the, 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 yeah, oh, with the macchie. Blotches. Blotches, yeah, blotches, okay. yeah. Uh, at the base small, of the petals. The basal flecken, that's the word on the Deutsche sagen. Uh, um, and this one also gives the vigor. And then you have to notice that both Peonia ostia and Peonia rocchia are white. So the question is, where do the color come from? So there must be other species which brought the colors into the blood. And one of them is Peonia chewy which is a tiny peony. It grows probably no more than 50 centimeters with a flower, which is tiny in comparison. The flower is probably eight, 10 centimeters in diameter. And it creates lots of suckers from, from the base. It's nearly a dwarf plant, uh, but it bears a darker color. Um, another one that brings a darker color is so-called peonia decomposita or peonia sequanica because it comes from the mountains of uh, Sichuan. And look why it's called decomposita. Look at the leaves, how, how finely um, um, divided they are. They look like feathers nearly. And then the most important of all, it's peonia gijanensis, uh, which actually uh, is the most similar to the uh, sufruticosas. But funny enough, the only Dijonensis known in the wild are white. So the question is, how can we have red tree peonies when in the wild there are no red peonies? Probably there was a form of Peonia Dijonensis which was red and which is extinct in nature. So it doesn't exist anymore. It was collected to extinction, but probably hundreds of years ago when the Chinese were producing those hybridizations, it probably was so over collected at the time that it's now extinct. So the only Apionia gijanensis that is known today in the wild, it is actually quite rare, is white. Uh, 
But um, this male pot of genes out of those five species uh, gives what? Gives this. And this is my, my the field, my collection. <laughs> Basically, any form or shape uh, and any color with blotches, without blotches, with single flowers, with double flowers, which plants that are erect or more dwarf or, you know, uh, anything is possible with peonies. Although, as you see, my preference always goes to plants with simple flowers. I like to see the yellow stamens in. Uh, this one, for example, it's a really, really nice hybrid between Peonia ostii and Peonia rockii. And I can tell you why. The structure of the plants, it looks like Peonia ostii. The flower looks like Peonia ostii because you see the center is red, not white, but it bears the blotches of Peonia rockii. And being a hybrid between two extremely vigorous plants, this is the result. So a plant which is extremely vigorous. This plant, you know, is probably 12 year old from seed, which, you know, for a peony is nearly a baby, you know, being a slow. But if you compare this one to another hybrid 12 years old, you know, it's probably 10 times bigger. Um, here again, uh, hybrids uh, in my peony field and on the back in the background you see the garden we have just seen so which goes from the hedge on the left to the ugly houses on the right so you see how small it is but how in the picture you know frame in certain view it can look bigger uh, you know more peonies more fun uh, you know, I have all neighbors, you know, <laughs> looking through the fences. That's the, that's the joy. And last year, for example, it was very frustrating because I was blocked in London because of the lockdown. You know, I came back from Italy in London just before Italy closed everything. So it was like now it was the beginning of March. And then I was able to come back to Italy it was the end of May. So I lost completely the peony season in the garden. You know, after having worked an entire year around the peonies to see them in flower, <laughs> I miss them completely. However, uh, I have a friend, she's a florist, and she was desperate because when they allowed the florist to reopen for Easter or for Mother's Day in May, she did not have any supply of flowers at all. Because, you know, the Dutch had thrown away all the flowers. Nothing is produced in Italy anymore. So there was really nothing. And so she asked me, she said, oh, can I go to your garden, you know, and, and collect some peonies? And uh, that was the news of the, you know, she sold like hundreds of euros in peonies. So in a way, that was uh, the good ending uh, for, for my peonies. At least someone enjoyed them in a bunch of flowers. And, you know, my friend made some money, you know, and she gave some to me, so which in a way contribute to the maintenance of the garden. Uh, so I'm, that was my experience. That was what I like, uh, what makes me happy. And uh, I'm here to answer questions if, if, if you want, if you wish, please. Fantastic, absolutely lovely. I mean, I loved the whole the whole thing how you said always it grows around the corner from me it you know you know you've thought about everything that you've put in there um and the photos were very beautiful and showed us a great deal all the plant names i'm sure people are going to want a list um but we can maybe try now there's i see there are 32 chats i can't put the chat on because i'm recording so i've you know been recording the slides so yvonne um or anybody who's actually asked a question that hasn't been answered on the chat perhaps you'd like to maybe put your you know just pipe up and answer uh, 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 ask mateo yeah uh, do 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 ask questions it's the nicest yeah, bit is when we ask questions you know maybe if actually mateo now if you would take your slideshow down down one sec and then we can all see each other as if we're in a room okay and i shall go to uh where was it 
uh, show as agreed. Sorry? Angela, was it show as agreed? No, you, you just close your, close, your script, close your PowerPoint. Have I done it? Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, now we're all on on a well. At least I've now got a gallery view, so we can see okay. all our faces. Okay. And and you're you're just one of many little stamps. Can you okay, see yourself fantastic. there? <laughs> you're right in the middle at the top for me, anyway. Okay. Okay. So, Matteo, I would. I? Matteo, I would like to know what the temperatures are like in your garden. What you know? Uh, my your, garden your, is. Your... Yeah. 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 Easy. Easy. It's, and do you have to protect your peonies in the winter? No, absolutely not. Uh, the peonies are extremely hardy. At least the ones I... Uh, they're all hardy because, you know, they come from continental China. A continental China is at least two climatic zones colder than where I live. So there is no problem. I am in zone between eight and nine. I would say 8B in USDA zones. So I normally have you know, minus six, minus seven, minus eight, once in the winter, it's normal. Uh, sometimes you can have minus 10, minus 12 is very rare. It happens once every 10 years, probably. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. Nicholas. Yeah. Nicholas. Oh, th thank you. Hey, that, that was a blisteringly good presentation. Thank Very you. inspiring, yeah. So um, have you worked, you mentioned the hybrid peonies. Have you worked with Ito hybrids by chance? I, they are not my favorites, unfortunately. I don't know why. Oh. The Ito are extremely good garden plants because they are very vigorous and they flower for a long time. They flower late, so even in countries where you have late frosts, they are completely out of that problem. But uh, they don't look that well, in my opinion, in a naturalistic setting as the one I have chosen. So that's why I haven't used them in my garden, and I don't have them in my collection yet. Uh, mm. Probably in the next life, when I will have you know, four hands and days of 48 hours, then <laughs> I can probably, uh, but they, they, they are beautiful plants. I know for a fact that my friend Maurizio, he will talk next month, he has used some of them in his own garden. And um, the first generation of the Ito hybrids are very kind of yellow. So not so easy to, you know, they're very abundant in flowers, but not so easy to, insert into a naturalistic setting. But the next generation, which bear more peachy colors, they are much easier to insert. Um, um, however, they are extremely good garden plants, yes, uh, without any doubt. Yeah, just to, um, so the, I, I used to work for a nursery company called Monrovia, and in collaboration with a Ito peony breeder on the East Coast, we, are, we were the first nursery to bring Ito's to market in yeah. America. And the program was wildly successful, yeah, yeah, just yeah, wildly yeah. successful. And the trial, we, we actually, we've had Ito's down in San Diego um, that are now like seven, eight years old and bloom regularly. And, and as far north, you know, up into Canada. Where yes, they're yeah, very versatile. They're very versatile. Yeah. Yeah, 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 the, yeah. the diversity has just been astounding. So yeah, your, your yeah. presentation was the tops. Absolutely, yeah. the top. Thank you. Anybody else? Could we go back to climate uh, again? <laughs> Could we go back yes, to climate of course. again? Um, I'm in southwest France. Um, southwest like, France. Yeah, it's yeah. similar. So the, it's less the, wet, but similar. Yeah, this morning I woke up to a frost, uh, but it was 15 to 16 during the day. I was in yeah, the yeah. It's... So probably, do you get how much rain do you get in the summer? Uh, I mean, our average is around uh, 1100, 1100 millimeters, so a meter. Yeah. Uh, but it's badly distributed because it yeah. rains a lot in November, but in the summer it doesn't rain much. Not at all. Um, We've had two really very dry summers. I've had to change quite a lot. It's been climate, I, I'm assuming it is climate change. 
it's the seasons are becoming more um, unpredictable. Yeah. Because, for example, we have now a very warm spell in in mid February, and then a sudden frost like last week. And for example, all, all the magnolias, what Nicholas has got in his, sure, yeah. in his background, were gone within you know a couple of hours. Yeah. Those which were opened already. Hopefully, the one that are still in bud will 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 bloom. But you know, that's okay. that's the unpredictable climate. Yeah. Okay, it's really interesting, and thank you. And my peonies are coming up now, and it's very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Pleasure. Um, can you? Uh, can you remind me of that plant uh, that goes in the wheat that is poisonous? It's called uh, Agrostemma gitago. Agrostemma gitago. Thank yeah. you. And. Uh, but do you find them around? Uh, I mean, <laughs> my. S Chilton seeds, I would say, but now anything can come out of England. So probably I would say Jalika. Well, my son is a, is a farmer, so maybe he knows it. Uh, but if it's, maybe they, they just kill it because he does. They, they, wheat. They, they, it was killed, yeah. it was easy to kill with, with killers, yeah. yeah. Uh, and no, you can have it in, it in pink, which is, but also the yes. other in white. They are both yeah. beautiful. But can it I goes back. Do you? Okay. I'm so, sorry. Sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. I wanted to tell uh, to tell you, Anna Maria. I am uh, Chantal Giraud from the seed list. I'm running the seed list. Yeah. And uh, I have seeds of Agrostema Gitagos if if she wants. Ah, fantastic. And as as any member of MGS, you are allowed to ten packets per year. Wow. Really, it's free for oh. the members. So you can choose anything on the list, which is very huge because we had, uh, this year we had um, a big, big offer of uh, the Chateau Perouse. Uh, you, you can remember perhaps if you read the, the journal uh, of MGS, you have uh, uh, yes. an article of this, of this uh, garden. So okay. if, you, if you write down, you, you have to go to the, to the website, and if you write down to me, you ask me the the seeds. I, with you pleasure, can. I will send you. I will send you the seeds. Oh, thank you very much. I will do it. I will do it. The well, best season, you. the best season to put them in the soil is uh, actually the end of the summer, because uh -huh, they yes. germinate like the wheat. They germinate uh -huh. in the autumn. They overwinter yeah. and they flower in spring. Mm -hmm. If you put them in the yeah. soil in the spring, uh, they don't do yeah. well. So. Okay, thank you. Thank uh, you very I much. Great sorry, sorry, sorry. Can I have Yvonne? Because Yvonne has got her hand up. Okay. Okay. Uh, could I just ask you, please? Hi, Yvonne. Hi. Hi. A um, uh, question that lots of people have been asking on the chat is can you repeat the name of that gladiolus? <laughs> De Morti. <laughs> the glad yeah, exactly. It doesn't have a name. Uh, not... dei Morti, that's how, how we call it. How do we buy it? Where do we find it? Because it's wonderful. <laughs> you know, there is a problem with it because oh. it's highly virused. Ah. Oh. Uh, oh. The flower, you know, we are talking about viruses. Yeah, lovely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The <laughs> pandemia of the gladioli. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it bears a schizovirus, which, which makes the flowers with, uh, which like little lines inside. Mm. The virus doesn't do anything at all to the plant, which is extremely vigorous, but the virus can be transmitted to other iridaceae. In uh. fact, other gladioli or other crocuses or anything which is iridaceae. So if someone wants to try it and it doesn't have, uh, I mean, I, I, I have some bulbs, uh, but... Um, I'm always uneasy in give it away. Uh, you know, you would, you would say it's an excuse to make it more precious, but it's actually true. So uh, it's at, at your own risk, you can, you can try it. Yeah. Okay, okay. Christina? Uh, Christina? Sorry, Christina okay. is... Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, we're raising hands like we're back in school again. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm coming from Athens, Athens, Greece, and uh -huh. our climate has very close to Yamis. 
Um, yeah. Our climate has definitely changed, um, especially where I'm living in the area that was burned three years ago. Um, it's windy all year long now all year long, and yeah. extremely oh dry. Even now I'm out watering uh, some of my plants. I have done it today, yeah. Yeah, and I'm wondering if there's a particular peony you can recommend that would put up with winds right off the Mediterranean Sea um, and very dry you summers. You know what the problem is with peonies? They need uh, some degrees below zero to mm. trigger the hormones to flower. Okay. So uh, you were saying tree peony or herbaceous peony? I, either, whichever, they're all beautiful. Yeah. There is one uh, variety of tree peony, which grows fantastically in Southern Italy, like in Naples or in Palermo, where basically there is no frost. Mm -hmm. And it's a Chinese peony. So it was bred by the Chinese 100 years ago. And mm -hmm. when it was brought in Europe, clearly <laughs> the French gave it a name. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just joking. And it's, and it's called uh, Duchesse de Morny. Say it again. Duchesse, like the Duchess, la Duchessa. Right. De Morny, D-E-M-O, um, M-O-R-N-Y. Right. And uh, I can tell you there are there is one nursery in Italy that sells it. Uh, can I say it, uh, Angela, or yes, is it? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, um, Buffa, Peonia Buffa in Turin. Okay. B-U-F-F-A, they sell it as grafted plants. And it's very easy and it's, and it's very adaptable for the hot climate. It's quite filled, it's not a simple flower, it's very double, but the flower is not too big. What color is it? It's 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 a beautiful pink, mm. and it, it flowers yeah. very very early. So I would suggest that one for the Mediterranean climates. Yeah. And you know, in Naples, it flowers like now. Can uh, I can I just add? I bought it. it I've planted it in the autumn, in this early this spring from oh. Riviere. From Riviere. From Riviere. It's quite. It's relatively common. It's a classic. It's France, a classic. So you can easily get it. You see it in all the old gardens in France. Exactly. It's a classic. It's a classic. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you. Well, well chosen. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? If I can ask another question. Yes, of course you can. A lot, a lot. Uh, yes, we, we saw a picture at the last uh, show uh, of a peony called G. Chanensis. G. Chanensis, yes, yes, yes. And there was a nice iris on the <laughs> right. Very thin iris. It's what iris is... confuser, iris confuser. Yes. And the, yes. yeah, but wait, wait, wait. The form is um, uh, what is called Iris um, Confuser. For Martin, Rick, Martin Ricks. Oh. It is the form which was brought back to England by uh, Martin Ricks, who has a special who... eye for anything which is fantastic. Yeah. Okay. It, many, you. many iris confuser are very weedy. So the leaves get ruined or the flowers is tiny and of a pale blue. That one is fantastic. Unfortunately, the only one that sells it is um, on the other side of the channel now, is <laughs> Nick Mesa, Pan Global Plants. Uh, but uh -uh. you might ask to, you might be able to sell it as bare-rooted rhizomes, so which makes it easier uh, to send it to the yeah, continent after Brexit. It's going to be very difficult now to get plants from from uh, United. From yeah, from yeah, Britain. yeah. But I don't know. I'm I'm sure that a solution will be found. I'm I I am faithful. <laughs> Thank you. Pleasure. Can I ask, um, uh, are the peonies, um, uh, do the peonies get eaten by um, uh, porcupines? Because my no. iris 
no, my no, Irish no, get no, eaten no, by no. porcupines. I'm no. in Tuscany. We have I a know. lot of I know. I know, I know, I know. I have a client in Montalcino. <laughs> We yes. did a beautiful garden with iris. They were all gone in two all months. Eaten. All yeah. gone. All yeah. gone. And, no. I get, and my roses get eaten by deer. By the deers. No, nothing eats peonies. They are so disgusting, probably, really? that no one touches them. The only by problem with the... peonies is the rain, because Mar Maurizio Sai took us to a peony nursery near Viterbo, oh. and they rained the, the, the week before and they were all bombed there was nothing to see <laughs> uh, i know i know but you see um if you choose peonies with simple flowers yes. they do last longer than the ones yeah. with uh very filled flowers um and by the way in tuscany on the apennino between tuscany and emilia romagna there is a wild peony, so they grow wild. Oh, really? And they also grow between Umbria and Marche, so it's really? there oh, are yeah. wild peonies, so the the animals don't eat them. I'm hundred percent. I, I get a lot of wild uh, flowers, but I've never had a wild peony. I get wild gladioli and tulips and uh, orchids and orchids. It's just wonderful. <laughs> so <laughs> but, after, uh, can I interrupt? Here. Sorry. Um, so from your herbaceous hybrids, you said go and get a catalog. Uh, yeah. You know, if we, so do you have any, uh, you know, uh, the fav uh, favorites were? My favorites uh, definitely in Italy, in Italy I would suggest Buffa, Buffa. Giovanni Buffa. Si. And then a fantastic catalog with herbaceous hybrids is a German guy, it's called Stefan Schulze. Uh, S C H. Somebody, I can write it down if you S want. No, no, it's okay. Can I? Can I? Look at the chat. Ah, let me do. Stefan. Stefan. Can you see it? Yes. Anyone who's got the chat open can see. Yeah. It. So yeah. you know. Okay. And I can also. Uh, Clearly, Riviera. Riviera's got some. Uh, then there is another, a Dutch, or a Riviere in France. Then is Varmerda in uh, uh, Holland. Okay. And then Giesler, it's another German guy. Um, okay, so then, listen, I'll, I'll tell, I'll, I'll, what I'll do is I'll get these names off the chat and we'll yeah. send you all... Um, the next link, so I'll, or maybe yeah. I'll send them out tomorrow. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then I, had, I imported some from, from the US at a great expense, but I imported them from, from Clem, from Don Hollywood, from, uh, there was a, a, a Canadian nursery as well in the French speaking part of Canada. I don't even remember the name. So La Pivonier, La Pivonier, I don't even remember the name. But however, um, yeah, it's it's yeah. it's a whole uh, kind of new world. It's obviously yeah, yeah exactly. Once exactly. you go in, you yeah. never get out. Matteo, okay, so I will, on behalf of everybody who's taken part today, say a fantastic. You know, as Nicholas said, it was a what did he say? Stonking. Oh, I think Brent wants to talk. Sorry, Brent, do you want to say something? Yes, I do. Uh, well, sorry, I'm having to put his hand up properly. <laughs> Um, I'm coming from the international plant world where we do uh, regulations for imports of plants. So when you talk, start talking about uh, bringing plants in from North America, etc., the Europeans have passed a new law that you need to make sure to check and follow because you can bring in really bad uh, pest diseases. So there's regulations to follow and I can, I can provide you with a website so you can contact uh, the European Commission to find out what rules there are for bringing plants in. So I just want to make sure that you're aware of that. Thanks. Yeah. Brent works for FAO and he's actually looking at global plant safety and health and yeah. so you know that is a useful piece of information. Brent do you want to send it on the inf or to an yeah. email to me or put it on the chat? Uh, I'll, put, I'll put the web link to our site where you can go and find the country that you want to uh, you want to uh, import into and you can find out the regulations by talking to someone there. Uh. All right, thank you. I mean, it, it, it's an important point. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Great. All right. It, has everybody uh, finished? Um, Do I ask something? Yes. Yeah. yeah, of course. May I ask something? Martha, of, course. of course. Okay. I live in Rome. I had a garden, a dry garden, completely dry in Umbria for 25 years. I never watered. It was definitely um, whatever. Dry. dry. No, it was beautiful actually I learned how to do it but that's another discussion but cystus I used a lot of cystus which I think is a rock rose yes. in yes. English and it was beautiful and of course the flowers only last for a day but then they come, they come back to produce and I, seeing all your beautiful peonies which I also had but you know, they're much, they were much more restricted. I used lots of cystus in the early stages of the Mediterranean part of my garden uh, okay. because they grow very quickly yes. and they do fill the space. Mm -hmm. But of clearly, I didn't show you those pictures okay. because at that time, the structure of the garden was nothing. Okay. Was basically the cypresses were like pencils <laughs> uh, because I planted everything tiny with a tiny budget. Yeah. So by the time the structure became mature, okay. the cystus were dead oh God. because the cystus don't live long. You know, a cystus, if you are lucky, lives seven, eight, ten years, maybe. Yeah. But then yeah. naturally they die quickly. They grow quick, fast, and they die fast. So yeah. like yeah. lavender in a way. Yeah. I'm now in Rome and am using a lot of camellias. Yeah, yeah. If you if you can in Rome, the, the, the soil is blessed because Dude, it's, well, it's, no, I have a there. I have a courtyard garden now, so I'm planting in different ways. But, but you will see, you will see next month. You know, Maurizio in right. Sardinia, he has a acidic soil or at least a siliceous soil, okay. and he can plant all the acidic plants he wants, like in New Zealand or like in Southern California. Wow. So. It, and you will have lots of fun with magnolias, rhododendrons, uh, indica, <laughs> azaleas, which you will never ever think that in Sardinia it's possible to, you know, <laughs> to, have, to have all that. So. Wonderful. Okay, thank you. It was lovely to, Pleasure. to hear and to see. <laughs> Congratulations. Well done. Grazie. <laughs> thank you for following. And... Uh, uh, and join us and join us obviously keep joining us you know we oh yeah, yeah i we, will we, definitely you know, will in the other speak we've got i've got uh chile chile i've got south africa i've got oh, uk yeah. coming up in the next cycle so maurizio uzai who matteo has mentioned is is going to talk about planting in sardinia yeah and then uh we'll go down in the summer there's in the southern hemisphere to their summer for the next three three um, talks, so we'll bring in some other Mediterranean climate zones. Fantastic. Okay, thank you all. Thank you very much for joining. Ciao, presto. Bye bye. 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 Bye bye